Let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and there shall be another creation, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, you have instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of your Holy Spirit. Under the inspiration of the same Spirit, grant that we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in your consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, welcome back from your Easter break. I hope you all had an enjoyable uh, Easter, even under these strange circumstances. And now, in the wake of Easter, we'll be getting into uh, topics related to the Holy Spirit, the Church, the sacraments. Today's lecture is for Wednesday, April 15th, and the topic for today is the Holy Spirit. So we'll be looking into the question, what is the Holy Spirit? And what is its role in the Christian life? What does the Holy Spirit do? What is its effect on Christian life? And on this first slide, I put an image of the back stained glass window of St. Peter's Basilica, the very window that Sri describes in his chapter, Clothed with Power from on High, chapter 6 of Love Unveiled. He has a whole section on this dove window, uh, which was originally designed and crafted by Bernini and is still there in St. Peter's Basilica. And it's a depiction of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I thought uh, maybe the best way to get into what the Holy Spirit is, is to describe the experience that the Christians had of the Holy Spirit's descent at Pentecost. So this is the event that Christians identify as the moment in which the Holy Spirit comes into the world fully and becomes fully integrated into uh, the Christian life, becomes really the animating source of the Christian life and the life of the church. Pentecost is the event that Christians refer to as the birthday of the church, the day in which the Christian community was truly born. But let's back up a little bit from that day. We need some context here. So we left off last time talking about the resurrection. And after the resurrection, Jesus appears to people. And it's not on just one day. It's not on just uh, Easter morning and Easter day but for many days after that. And the number that is uh, usually associated here is 40 days. So Jesus appears to Peter. He appears to the people on the road to Emmaus. He appears to, St. Paul says, more than 200 people in his resurrected form. So he's in the world, still alive, appearing to people, risen from the dead, there are some strange things about him, though. He can appear and disappear. He can disguise himself, although he still eats. He still speaks. He still interacts. He still has bodily form. You can touch him. Uh, but he is in a state of transition. He himself says that unless I go to the Father, uh, the advocate cannot come. And whom he means by the advocate here is the Holy Spirit. And so before he ascends to the Father, he says, uh, he gives the disciples some instructions. He says, stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift my Father promised. So this is uh, at the very end of Acts chapter 1. And Acts chapter 2 is what depicts the event of Pentecost itself. And then Jesus ascends to the Father. He ascends into the heavens, into the sky, right in front of the eyes of his followers. And they stand there staring at the sky after he goes. And an angel appears to them standing there and says, Why do you look up at the sky like that? Why are you gawking 
at the place where uh, Jesus rose. Go and do what he said and wait for the one to come that he promised. So this isn't just an elaborate bon voyage party, as Michael Himes says. Michael Himes' emphasis on the ascension is that it's the moment in which God's um, humanity in Jesus Christ becomes fully incorporated into God himself. Jesus as a human being, a fully alive human being, ascends to the right hand of the Father. So now Jesus' humanity is a part of who God is uh, from all eternity. But in terms of where things go from here, it is a transition point. The disciples are waiting for something, the gift my father promised, the advocate. Jesus himself refers to the Holy Spirit kind of obliquely. And as we'll see only in John chapter 20, does he really talk about his, uh, the Holy Spirit as something that uh, he gives directly. But the disciples wait for nine days. Uh, they wait in Jerusalem until this feast of Pentecost. So this is originally a Jewish feast. Uh, it's called the Feast of Weeks in the Jewish tradition. It commemorates the offering of the first fruits of the earth to God on each year. But it's also commemorating the reception of the law that God gives to Moses by the people who were waiting for Moses to descend from Mount Sinai. So it's associated with the growing cycle. It's also associated, though, perhaps even more prominently with the giving of the law by God to Moses, who then gives it to the people uh, 50 days after he goes up the mountain to receive the law. So it's called the Feast of Weeks because it happens on the 50th day, the day after uh, seven periods of seven days. And it's on this day when the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus' followers. So it's important to note that this was a significant feast in Jerusalem. Uh, people were supposed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. And so you had adherence to the Jewish faith uh, from all over the world in Jerusalem, gathered together there for this uh, festival, for this big feast. Jesus' disciples were gathered together, and they were waiting. They were praying. It's important to note that they didn't know in advance what would happen or when it would happen, only that Jesus said, stay and wait for this promised event for the coming of the one that the father has promised so it's a little bit of an open-ended posture of receptivity they're not summoning the holy spirit they're not controlling it or making it come down they're waiting for it and when it comes the first phenomenon that occurs is a sound like the blowing of a violent wind and this has very important symbolic resonance as we'll come to see the Holy Spirit first appears as this violent blowing wind. It's not this gentle breeze. It's a very distinct and sudden event, not something that could have been ignored by them. The next thing they notice during the event at Pentecost is the descent of these tongues of fire that come and descend upon the heads of each one of them. Now, it's often depicted as literal, actual fire on their heads, as you see here in this Egyptian Coptic icon of Pentecost. But Acts 2 just makes a comparison to fire. Tongues as a fire come and descend upon each one of them. Now, the image of fire is important, though both for the Holy Spirit, but also to hearken back to an image in Exodus, where God inhabits his tabernacle, this structure dwelling that the Israelites build uh, at God's instructions, a part of God's law, and God comes to dwell in the tabernacle, directly over the Holy of Holies, directly over the Ark of the Covenant, as a pillar of cloud, or a pillar of smoke, 
maybe might be even better translation. During the day, it appears as a, a pillar or a column of smoke, and at night it appears as a pillar or a column of fire. You know God is there in the temple of this, if this pillar of smoke and fire appears over the holy place. And now we have a little version of that over each individual follower of Jesus. So you might be able to see here what's being conveyed there. Uh, in the old law, or the old dispensation, God descends into his dwelling at one particular place in space and time, and does so by appearing as a pillar of smoke and fire. But now God inhabits each individual follower of Jesus. So they, in a sense, become walking tabernacles, portable temples, God's real presence dwelling in them, they become the privileged site where God is present in the world. So we have tongues of fire, but we also have tongues as in language. The people begin to speak and to hear languages that they do not understand, or at least that they did not understand before this event. And it's noted at least twice that they find themselves able to communicate to others that they were not able to communicate with before because they were able to speak and to understand these languages that they were not fluent or conversant in. And there's a little bit of a play on words here with the tongues reference, tongues of fire, tongues of language. They have, in a sense, a common reference point, though, in that they both refer to a reversal of the event of Babel in the Old Testament. You might remember in Genesis, the people of Babel uh, learn how to make bricks and then build this tower up to the heavens. God feels threatened by their hubris and so confuses them and scatters them, makes them unable to understand each other. And they begin speaking in languages that are unintelligible to other people. And so they flee from each other. They scatter to different parts of the world. And this is the origin story for all the different races and cultures in the world. But the, the broader message is one of division, disintegration, uh, alienation from one another. So what's going on here at Pentecost is a reversal of that. You have a mutual intelligibility of communication and therefore a connection, an integration, a unity that which was divided and scattered at Babel now becomes uh, united uh, and coherent at Pentecost. Okay, so that is the event at Pentecost. It's the event that Christians point to as sort of the primary locus for identifying what the Holy Spirit is and what it does in the world. It is the origin of the church and that which inhabits the followers of Jesus to, in a sense, perpetuate the Incarnation to continue God's incarnate presence in the world, not through one individual God-man, but through their humanity, now infused with the life of God because of what Jesus did, but through the direct mediation of the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't an event that just uh, comes out of nowhere. It's not just sort of a random category invented whole cloth. Uh, it's a culminating act of a biblical figure that appears throughout the scriptures, the figure of God's spirit or God's breath. And the key reference point here is this Hebrew word ruach, which means either wind or breath or spirit. It could mean either one of these, and it can mean all three of these at the same time. It gets translated into Greek as pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, and it's the same connotation. It can mean wind, it can mean breath, it can mean spirit. And the Latin is spiritus, which is where we get our word spirit from. And so it has a very broad um, sense of uh, meaning. Uh, it isn't just sort of the inner self. It isn't just this immaterial ghost inside of us. It is the breath or wind of God. That gives life. And it appears at the very beginning of Scripture. So it appears in Genesis 1, where the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This is the first act of creation. God's Spirit, or breath, 
hovers over the waters like a wind. And the image is, is very clear. Uh, the wind blowing over the waters is what gives rise then to everything that ensues. Uh, all creation comes from this initial act of God's spirit hovering over the chaotic primordial waters. It's also what makes the first human being live. In Genesis 2, the Lord forms a human figure out of clay or mud and then breathes into its nostrils the breath of his life. And this is what makes Adam alive. This is what makes him a human being instead of just uh, a lump of clay or a collection of dust. But it's the Lord who bestows his own breath or ruach of life into Adam that makes him alive. So God's spirit is what gives rise to everything, the whole creation, and it's what makes Adam alive. It's what gives Adam his existence. And the ruach appears next, most notably in the story of the Exodus. So it's what saves the Israelites ultimately when they are backed up against the Red Sea. And then, as you hopefully remember, the waters are parted. And there's like a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left, and the Israelites pass through it. Well, what made those walls appear? Well, in the movies, it's often Moses extending his staff and then miraculously, like a magic trick, the waters part. But what Exodus actually says is that all night long, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind. So it's the Lord who does it, and he does it with a wind, with a ruach. And you might even say with his own breath, uh, with his spirit. It's the spirit that divides the water so that the Israelites can pass through. And this is, in a sense, like creation, an act of division that gives life. So in creation, God separates the waters from the heavens. He separates the land from the sea. Here he's separating the waters in order, in a sense, to give birth to the nation of Israel. Uh, but it's his breath that does it, his ruach. The next notable occurrence of this word appears in Psalm 51, where David is pleading for forgiveness to God in Psalm 51. And he cries out to God, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I believe, I'm about 90% sure, this is really the first place where we see this conjunction of these two words, holy and spirit, in the Bible. And what is David referring to here? Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Well, if he just said, do not take your spirit, do not take your breath from me, we could think, well, he's just talking about his life. Don't kill me. Don't withdraw your breath from me so that I'll die because of what I did. Understandable enough. But to add the word holy here makes it a little more ambiguous. And one could think that given the rest of this psalm, where David is pleading with God not to abandon him, not to withdraw from him. He's pleading for forgiveness, for restoration of relationship. We could think of it as something more about who God is in himself, and not just something that proceeds from God that gives life, but something that characterizes who God is in himself. The next uh, occurrence that's worthy of note is from the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel has this vision where he sees a whole valley full of dried bones of Israelites that have been killed in battle. And in this vision, the Lord instructs him to breathe upon these slain that they may live. And it's through this breath that the bones begin to take form again and that they come alive. And so we see here the same kind of dynamic of the Ruach uh, entering into dead, inert matter and making it live. And of course, this is a vision that's not so much a portent of the future, but is a spiritual message. That Israel is spiritually dead. It is, is, is spiritually a valley of dry bones and, and God wants to breathe his very life into the people again so that they might live in the fullest sense. Then in the New Testament, the first major appearance of the Holy Spirit, chronologically anyway, is at the Annunciation. So Jesus's very existence begins with 
the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming upon Mary, who accepts this message from an angel that she will conceive, even though she's uh, unmarried and a virgin. And it is by the Holy Spirit overshadowing her, the Most High uh, overshadowing her, that she comes to have this life grow within her. So it's the Holy Spirit who gives life to Jesus himself at the Annunciation. It's the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary that uh, allows Jesus to uh, come into the world, which gives really rise to the Incarnation itself. And then at the baptism of Jesus, this turning point in his life, many people see this as the first revelation of the Trinity, because you have the Son being baptized, and when he comes out of the water, you have the dove descending upon him, symbol of the Holy Spirit. And then the Father's voice says, this is my beloved Son. So we have all three persons of the Trinity in this one event of the baptism. But the Holy Spirit is depicted as a dove here. And it's God's Spirit descending upon Jesus to and it's publicly identify him as the Son of God, as God incarnate. And then finally, at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus appears after his resurrection to the disciples, and he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why not just say, Receive the Holy Spirit? You know, why, why breathe on them? Uh, well, again, it's uh, in, in continuity with what has come before, that this Holy Spirit isn't just some new, novel, invented entity, this is the same breath of God that created the world, that gave life to the human person, that saved Israel from the Egyptians. It's the same Holy Spirit that has given life to the people and indeed gave life to Jesus himself. Uh, so this, this Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples in the Gospel of John as a result of Jesus himself breathing directly upon them and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. So this gives us some background, at least, to uh, what the Holy Spirit is in Scripture. So what do Christians actually believe the Holy Spirit is? Well, as we talked about last time, uh, most directly, God is the third person of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit is God. And just like the Son is no less God than the Father, the Holy Spirit is no less God than the Father or the Son. So from a Christian perspective, it is correct to say that the Holy Spirit is God. But what is this relation? How? How could this breath of God, the Spirit of God, be considered God himself? Well, to go back to the analogy of love, God is love, and therefore God is the communion of lover and beloved, and the love they share between them. The lover, of course, would be the Father, the beloved, the Son, who receives the love of the Father. But just as the Father's own self-understanding is so perfect, that it is, it, it is its own reality, it is its own center of identity, the love that is shared between lover and beloved is so perfect, it is such a direct reflection of who the lover and beloved are, that it is its own center of identity. It is its own person. It is its own reality. And so the Holy Spirit is that love which is shared by the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is, you might say, the motive of creation, the love that lies behind God's creative act. So if the Son is, in a sense, the blueprint, the thought that God had behind creation, love would be the impetus to bring that idea, that design, into being. Love is what moves God to create and what explains the ultimate intention of creation. So we could say the Holy Spirit is the love that brought us into being and the love that sustains our existence. Our very existence is a reflection of God's Spirit. But this love also seeks to restore us, perfect us, save us, redeem us. This is the love that moves God to intervene in the world, to act so as to save us from death, 
So it's not enough just to create life. God's love also seeks to protect, guide, save, and, per and, and perfect us. The Holy Spirit is thus the power that enables us to become like him, the ultimate end of the creation of a human person, union with God. But how? How can we become like God? How could we ever unite ourselves with God? Not by our own power. It's the power of God's Spirit in us that enables us to do this. I loved Sri's phrase that the Holy Spirit is God's first and greatest gift. So it's the gift that explains why we're here. But that, that gift, that reflection is something about God's very self. It, the explanation for why I exist is integral to who God is. It isn't something external, sort of a feeling or an itch God had one day. It's something that is the very core of God's self. And it's the love that makes and perfects us. So it's the love that draws us to our ultimate end. So the Holy Spirit is God's love, the love shared between Father and Son. And what's the, the characteristic activity of this love is to give gifts. So the Holy Spirit is the mediator of grace. Grace, of course, just means gift. And the gift that the Holy Spirit gives us is our very life. You may recall Himes' definition of grace as God's love outside the Trinity. There's your uh, token typo for the day. God's love outside the Trinity is what grace is. God loves from all eternity, but when God's love is directed outside the communion of the three persons of God, then it gives life to something distinct, something other. God withdraws or makes room for something else to exist, and God draws that other into its own life. So it's behind the very gift of life, and it's what gives us our existence. This is usually what is called in theological language prevenient grace. So the gift of who we are as we are. Prevenient is just a Latinate word that means that which comes before. So the grace of our very existence is the condition for receiving any other gift. Uh, you have to be a possible recipient of a gift in order to receive it. But the very gift of being such a possible recipient is itself a gift. Uh, and so there's grace behind everything that we are uh, at, at any and every moment of our existence. However, the Holy Spirit also offers us gifts that lead us to our perfection or salvation, that enable our ultimate fulfillment. So kind of like a parent who loves unconditionally their child, no matter what, at every moment, Nevertheless, they are empowered to assist them, perhaps even to push them, to become better, to realize their potential. It isn't just enough to say, well, I hope you exist and there you go, good luck. But to aid them, to interact with them, to help them to develop and mature. So this is the dimension of the Holy Spirit's gifts that help to save us. If love is willing the good of the other for the sake of the other, it is also a practical task of working to bring about that good for another. So you will the good for the other, not, not for yourself, but for the sake of the other, but it isn't just enough to wish them well. You have to do something in response to that disposition of the will to bring about what you will for the other and so the Holy Spirit does this too the Holy Spirit uh, acts so as to bring about the good that God intends for the human person so this is often referred to as sanctifying grace in theological terms it's the grace that the Holy Spirit bestows not just to bring us into existence but to make us holy to perfect us and the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit is that the gift that the Holy Spirit ultimately gives is 
himself. So the father gives everything he has to the son, the son gives everything he has to the father, and the Holy Spirit also gives everything he is in his self-offering to the father and the son. It's a communion of perfect self-giving love. The gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to human beings bear this same quality. Ultimately, what the Holy Spirit wants to give human beings is himself. And this happens through the gift of God's divine life in us. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in the human person, and therefore God himself comes to dwell within the human person. And this enables us, as Sri says, quoting Catechism, to partake of the divine nature. The more colloquial, we might say accessible way of understanding this is that the Holy Spirit makes us children of God. So we are no longer slaves or servants, but friends, children. We become part of God's family. We become integrated into this communal life that characterizes who God is. Okay, a couple brief notes about the images that are often associated with the Holy Spirit. I've talked about a few already. But I just want to qualify that all these images are borrowed from creation, they're borrowed from our experience. So we should remember that, that we're not really talking literally about these uh, physical realities. Uh, they, these are images of representations of the Holy Spirit, our ways of trying to get some grasp on what the Holy Spirit is. But Christians nevertheless think that these images do offer some window into what the Holy Spirit is like. So the first that we mentioned, breath or wind, that which gives life, that which is always saving and facilitating life for the, the human race and God's people. Also the dove, the dove that descends at the baptism. But really the origin of this symbol is from the flood story in Genesis. So Noah uh, is in a situation where, kind of like our situation, where he's trying to wonder after this huge catastrophe that shuts down the world, when can he go back? Uh, when can he resume life on the land? And he sends out a dove. And it keeps coming back because the ark is the only land that there is. And the one day that it comes back with an olive branch in its mouth, he knows that there is land out there that there is a future for them, that they can re-inhabit the world. So the dove comes to represent restoration, healing, peace, and hope, and comes to be associated with the Holy Spirit because of this uh, correlation. The Holy Spirit also comes to be symbolized as a fire. Pentecost is perhaps the best example of this, the tongues of fire that appear over the disciples' heads. But like breath or wind, fire is essential for life, particularly in the pre-modern world. You know, but even today, uh, we need combustion. We need fire uh, in order to exist. Without fire, we can't have warmth, can't have light, can't have protection. Especially if you're sleeping out in the open, you need a fire to protect yourself from animals. But humans also use the fire for transformation. It's how we cook food. It's how we boil water. It's how we do all kinds of other things like metallurgy. So the image that Shri focuses on mainly is this image of iron when it's placed in the fire. And he uses it to uh, illuminate what the Holy Spirit does to a human person when it comes to dwell in them. So what happens when a human person comes to interact with God the Holy Spirit? Well, like iron placed in a fire... The iron isn't simply dissolved in the fire. It isn't simply burned away. But it does take on some characteristics of fire. And it becomes hot. It begins to glow. It could even smoke. Uh, it's still distinct from the fire, but it comes to resemble the fire in a certain way. So similarly with the Holy Spirit and the soul, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't just simply absorb the human soul or destroy the human soul. It transforms it so as to make it more like itself, to give it qualities that it didn't have before, and qualities that are uh, redolent of uh, energy, warmth, uh, transformative power. But this transformation, it's key to mention, happens without destruction. 
So it bears repeating this principle which emerges from Catholic theology. Uh, you can never say it too often. That grace, or the gift of God, does not destroy nature, but rather perfects it. So the Holy Spirit, when it's acting upon a human person, doesn't have to destroy anything that is natural or innate to the human person, but perfects the person, refines it, it burns away all the impurities, all that is excessive or superfluous, and leaves only the true self. But it doesn't have to warp, distort, or uh, amputate anything in the human person in order to make room for God. It, destroy, it, it only destroys that which is unnatural and perfects what the human person is and was meant to be. A good image of this from Exodus 3, the burning bush. So Moses comes across this bush in the desert that's burning, but it's not consumed. And it's a strange sight. Uh, it's the first thing that's noted about this burning bush. But it's through this burning bush that God speaks to Moses, tells him his mission, and reveals to Moses his holy name. The burning bush comes to be a symbol then for, for many things, a symbol for Mary, but also a symbol for all of creation. If God is truly dwelling within the created reality. It sets it on fire, but not so as to destroy it or mar it, but so as to transform it and perfect it to make it more truly itself. And so a paradox arises. The Holy Spirit transforms us to make us more like God, and therefore, as human beings, that means we become more like Christ. What does God look like when he dwells fully within a human nature? Well, Jesus Christ. That's the Christian answer anyway. And so if we're all uh, being transformed into Jesus Christ, then isn't that kind of homogenizing? Uh, are we all going to become carpenters? Or are we all be going to become uh, men with beards, etc.? Uh, well, no, of course not. Uh, that's a sort of false uniformity. Conformity to Christ, paradoxically, is, is a key that unlocks each and every person's unique individuality. To become more like God means you become more yourself, which means you become more irreplaceable, more unique, more individual. And my go-to analogy here is popcorn. Uh, I know it may seem a little silly, but I think there's something to it. You look at a whole bunch of unpopped popcorn kernels, they all look the same, right? Almost indistinguishable, hard, round. Uh, it's hard, hard to tell one from the other, but you apply them to a heat source and they blow up, they explode, and they undergo a radical transformation. But note even here that th they don't change in substance. It's not as if they're a completely different substance. Uh, it's just that this change, this intense heating, uh, unlocks something that was inside them, unlocks a potentiality that was there all along. But here's the key uh, similarity here. It makes each one of those popcorn kernels even more unique and individual and distinct than it was before. So even if you uh, could tell those unpopped kernels apart, it becomes very easy to notice that each popped kernel is distinct. None of them are the same. So the Holy Spirit similarly transforms the human person to become something radically different and something even more distinct than before. Okay, what is this transformation about? Well, it isn't like an external chemical change. It's not a, a physical change. It is an interior transformation. And the way the New Testament talks about this is in terms of a new law that is being given to God's people. So the old, old law is the law of Moses, written on first on stone tablets and then on uh, papyrus or scrolls. And these are the rules that God gives the people for how to live. The new law, which is first mentioned in the 31st chapter of Genesis, is really about an internal law, a law that's not written on tablets or on parchment, but written upon the human heart. This is the words that God gives to Jeremiah. I will write a new law upon their heart. Oh, what could that mean? Uh, is, is, is this literal? Is this surgery? Well, no, it's a way of speaking. 
we say if we have memorized a poem or a song, we know it by heart. And similarly, you could say to know God's law, God's will in one's heart means that you have internalized it. And so you can see the whole plan, you can see the whole design, and it's not something that you have to remind yourself of by means of an external text, a rule that uh, you have to go and, and compare with your own understanding. The law written on the heart is, is fully internalized. Why or how? Because it's, it's a law of love. So if you want to be someone's friend, if you want to engage in a loving relationship with someone, you could read a book about how to be a good friend or about how to love somebody. But one would hope that the, the more you engage in that activity of being a friend, of loving someone else, that the less and less you would have to go back and look at those self-help books on how to be a good friend uh, or how to truly love somebody because you're immersed, you're engaged in that activity. And so if you're considering, should I do this or should I do that? The reference point is less, well, you know, what does Dr. So-and-so say I should do? But what effect would this action or inaction have upon the other person and upon my relationship to that other person? So the relationship itself kind of becomes the primary reference point for the order of actions, the principles and, and the rules of how one should live. I like to compare it maybe to the removing of training wheels. So when kids are learning how to ride a bike, you know, they, they use training wheels and it can be fun for a while, but you're basically just sitting on a seat and then pedaling and then something goes. Uh, you're in a sense kind of going through the motions that you would go through to actually ride a bike, but you have these safeguards there so you don't fall down all the time. And hopefully you, you learn how to balance, but uh, you're not really fully in charge of that activity. You're constantly held in check by these training wheels. But then when they're removed, there is more of a freedom. And there's a more sense of immersion and engagement in the activity. And so you might think that uh, this new law is, in a sense, God removing the constraints, the guardrails, or, you know, the bumper bars, if you go to the bowling analogy, of these external rules and laws and saying, it's been about love all along, and now I'm giving you my own spirit to enable you to love me such that that love itself will direct you toward the right way to go. But it isn't just simply a vague feeling. There are uh, means of guidance. There is still a law at work. There are still things that must be done and things that must be avoided to maintain a right relationship with God. But it's really God's own voice now that becomes the primary mediator of this law. So we're beyond here mere rules or principles. It isn't just simply about consulting the guidebook or the manual. It's about the promptings of love. So this is kind of the technical word or the theological word. God gives the soul through the Holy Spirit these promptings, these, these, these nudges, these tendencies or dispositions toward doing certain things, we're avoiding certain things. And this is the way that our conscience becomes formed by the Holy Spirit within us. God himself speaks to us directly. Uh, and shows us the path to go. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't sense God's absence or, or feel the need to ask God, uh, God's, God questions, but there is this possibility now of God's direct intervention in the human soul through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I had one example I wanted to mention to you in this regard, which comes from a book that I read in a previous class where a woman who uh, became pregnant and then discovered that her baby had a very severe congenital deformity, was considering whether to abort this baby or not. Now, this woman was a very committed, devout evangelical Protestant, very conservative for the most part, and so she was sort of shocked to uh, see herself even entertaining this possibility of terminating this pregnancy. But she writes in her memoir on, on her pregnancy, which is called Perfectly Human, that she thought 
it might be the kindest thing to do. She said as soon as Paul returned, Paul being her husband, having settled the girls to sleep. As we stared at our dilemma, we knew that a stark ethical principle was not enough to carry us through the rest of the pregnancy without hope. It was not enough to enable us to cope with the ongoing nausea, the threat of my back problem, and the chance of watching our baby die in pain. Principles, however sound they might be, were simply not enough to give us the capacity to go on. They stopped short, leaving a great chasm of pain. I remember the desperation in Paul's face as he suggested we pray. I've often heard people use the phrase God said to me, but I never understood what it meant until that evening in May, when I can only say we felt God speak a message to our hearts as clearly as if we'd been talking with us in person. Here is a sick and dying child. Will you love this child for me? The question reframed everything. It was no longer primarily a question of abstract ethical principle, but rather the gentle imperative of love. Before we finished praying, the chasm between the principle and the choice had been filled. So that's from her memoir, Perfectly Human. And it nicely illustrates the transformation here. Uh, so she was entertaining ethical principles and precepts. Uh, is, it, uh, is it morally right or is it just to do this or to do that? And she was at an impasse. And she didn't know what to do. They, 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 they all seemed hollow, these principles. And it was only in praying that she felt this prompting. Uh, God saying to her, here is a sick and dying child. Will you love this child for me? So she also felt primarily this prompting of love in her that led her to uh, live with her child for the nine months of the pregnancy. Okay, another way of maybe understanding the transformation that goes on with the Holy Spirit is in terms of vision. Uh, so this is a, a video, you might have seen these before, uh, about... Uh, a person who first puts on these glasses which correct color blindness. So these are people who have never seen color and who, when they put on these corrective lenses, are able to see color for the first time. And I find it to be a, a useful comparison because uh, people who receive the Holy Spirit are able to see the new world, to see the world in a different way. They're able to see things that may have been there before, but they were never able to see. It's a transformation that is internal. It's a transformation that involves their capacity to engage the world. Uh, and it transforms everything, as you'll see. So I'll just show you one little clip from this before we move on. What did you see? Did it work? Are you crying? <laughs> oh, shit. Yo, everything is so beautiful. Like, like life, bro. Life. I want some life shit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that sort of experience of transformation, of seeing life itself, seeing the whole world with a new dimension, is one possible way of understanding the transformation that comes about with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So Catholics understand the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives that transform the human person in an even more specific way. And they get uh, a list of seven specific gifts from the prophet Isaiah, who in chapter 11 lists the gifts of the Spirit of God, a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of fortitude, a spirit of knowledge, a spirit of piety, and a spirit of fear of the Lord. And these qualities come to characterize anyone who possesses God's Spirit 
because you might even you might even think that they are sort of um, uh, integral outgrowths or essential features of God and of therefore God's spirit. But what are they and, and how are they related to each other? I think one good way of understanding these gifts and maybe even remembering them is to look at how they kind of map progression towards holiness or progression towards unity with God, resemblance of God. And the first step of it is the last one that's mentioned. So the first step in really coming to relate to God is acknowledging that God is out there. And to acknowledge that God is out there is no small thing. It can really transform the way that you see yourself and see the world. I mean, just imagine like you think you're in the room by yourself and then all of a sudden you sense someone else is there. Right? What's your first immediate reaction? It's usually fear or uncertainty, right? Who's there? What is this reality beyond myself that, that is present to me? And um, usually that uh, this is associated with um, the Beatitudes, this should actually be uh, poverty of spirit. Uh, sorry about that, I switched to the Beatitudes. But uh, so Jesus has these set of Beatitudes which are characteristic of the new law. And they begin with blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. So the first step really is a sense that God is there and a sense of, well, I'm, I'm not in full control. Uh, I'm part of something bigger than myself. I'm smaller than I thought that I was. But then this leads, the next step, it leads to a sense of piety. Now, what's piety? It isn't just sort of religiosity. It's a sense of dependence. It's a sense of seeking God's mercy and aid. And this should be uh, meekness here. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So it's really calling out. So you admit your smallness and then you admit your need. You admit that I may not be self-sufficient. I may not be able to do it on my own. And you become docile and meek, pliable to God's action. And then the next step in this progression is a growing sense of who one is, seeing more of the truth about oneself. Usually the primary quality of this phase is a sense of, of mourning, of really seeing oneself as one is, because most of us have a self-image that is probably inflated, that is uh, greater, more exalted than it should be. So similarly, you, you acknowledge that you're part of a greater reality, you realize you're dependent, and you realize how far you have to go to really uh, get to where you're called to be. This is the gift of knowledge, seeing this gap between who you are now and what you're called to be. And it can produce a kind of holy mourning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This then leads to a determination, a conviction, a sense of, of perseverance and resolution to make it through the difficulty, to meet the challenge. And this comes to be associated with the beatitude about uh, justice. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. So you want to make things right. And even though it's hard, uh, you keep going. And you are resolved to make things right with God, even though it's hard. The next step, then, is the gift of counsel, or it's often called right judgment, where you come to develop a sensibility of what is right, what is the best thing to do, uh, you come to evaluate things in a, in a clearer, more accurate way, and it involves a practical dimension. So it often gets linked with the attitude of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So our primary response to, well, what's the right thing to do in the world? Usually the first step is mercy, is treating others with the sort of uh, mercy that we hope we're treated with. The next step then is the gift of understanding where you come to see the truth not only about yourself but about god so it's linked with the beatitude of, of purity of heart blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see god so this understanding then is really the uh precursor then to the final gift which is the gift of wisdom so wisdom is basically being able to see the whole seeing the interconnections seeing the whole plan and rationale of a thing taken as a whole 
And with regard to God, it is coming to experience that communion, uh, seeing the whole relationship in its full scope and enjoying it and entering into it fully and resting in it. And it comes to be linked with the final uh, beatitude of peacemaking. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And of course, with the Holy Spirit, that's the ultimate goal, to become children of God, to become uh, partakers in the divine life, part of God's family. Okay, I'll just mention very briefly these nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, which St. Paul mentions in his letter to the Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, sometimes translated as purity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These, you might say, are symptoms of a spirit infused life. These are the signs that one is filled with the Spirit, the uh, characteristics that are emitted from someone who is animated by God's own Spirit within them. Okay, two other thematic topics she deals with, justification and sanctification. All right, what are these big terms about? Well, if you break them down, they're pretty basic and intuitive, but they're still matters of debate, perennial debate. Justification basically is just about that process of reconciling with God. So to be justified means to be brought back into right relationship with God. And you might think of this in terms of a handshake. So if we find ourselves in a condition of sin, we find ourselves in a condition of alienation from God. So we're not in right relation. Sin has divided us from God, uh, and, and so we're alienated from him. We need to be brought back into right relationship. And the Holy Spirit facilitates this reconciliation, this being brought back into uh, right and proper terms with God. And that most specifically involves the forgiveness of sins. So it's no coincidence that when Jesus breathes upon the, Holy, upon the disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit, he then says, Whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whosoever sins you do not forgive are not forgiven them. So to have the Holy Spirit within you gives you the power to forgive. And it's God's own power that is bestowing this forgiveness. And the experience of forgiveness is really the first step towards this right relationship with God, which is really the point of, of the Christian faith. So that's justification. This is making things right with God. Sanctification, though, goes beyond that. To sanctify something means to make it holy. So sanctification is really the process of being made holy. But more specifically, it's, it's the living out of this relationship. So you're put back on right terms with God, but then that's not the end of the story. It's really just the beginning. You have to live out that right relationship now, and it has to mature and lead somewhere. And what does it look like? Well, Christians describe it as a kind of friendship. Friendship is something that's ongoing. You can be alienated from a friend. You can do something to kind of betray a friendship or break a friendship. If you restore that friendship, then you don't just say, okay, fine, now I'll send you a Christmas card maybe. Uh, you say, no, we're going to recommence our life together. We're going to be friends, which means we're going to interact. We're going to share our lives. We are going to communicate. We're going to share your experience and activities. And so sanctification is about this ongoing drama that follows after we are made right with God. And it's characterized by a friendship and also by growth and holiness. So the change that occurs when we turn around and orient ourselves toward God, when we put ourselves back on the path to God, uh, this is then followed by progress on that path. So we continue on that path and we grow closer and closer to God and, and we grow in our own personal holiness, personal resemblance to God. I thought a couple examples might help with this. So the story of the prodigal son, you may remember from Theology 1, a son goes off and uh, spends the inheritance uh, that he's taken from his father prematurely. And then uh, after it's all spent and gone, he's basically living among the pigs as a, the lowest of slaves. And then he returns to the father and says, just make me one of your slaves. The father receives him joyfully and throws a big party for him, celebrating his return. Not only forgives his sins, but uh, joyfully welcomes him back. Uh, the prodigal son would be strange if the father says to the son, yes, I forgive you, 
thank you for coming back and admitting you're wrong. Uh, and now you can go off and live with the slaves, and uh, I no longer, you know, need to see you again necessarily. Um, that would have fulfilled the prodigal son's request, right? He just wanted to survive. He just wanted to stop having to eat the pig slop. But the, the, that's not enough for the father. The reconciliation with the father is really a precursor to the ongoing relationship uh, that follows from that. So the party is thrown not so much because the son has admitted his wrong and the father has forgiven the son, but because they've been brought back into a right relationship with each other that they can then continue. It's like the difference between an engagement and a marriage. Right? Uh, you propose to somebody, they agree to marry you, and then something follows from that, right? A whole life, in fact, uh, a whole life together. If you propose to somebody and engage them and then just disappear, uh, then what's the point, right? It's sort of like, well, what follows from that? The whole point of getting engaged and proposing is to uh, enter into a common life together. So this helps us to really understand if, if justification is really just the entryway, the precursor to the rest of the Christian life, which is about sanctification, then we can better understand this uh, perennial historical controversy over faith and works. It's primarily a controversy between Protestants and Catholics. Um, you have on the one hand this verse by St. Paul, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So what is it that saves us? How are we saved? Well, St. Paul says you're saved by grace, so it's a free gift. It's necessary for salvation, but nevertheless not something you've earned it's a free gift from God, a gift God has given you without merit, without you deserving it. And you've been saved by receiving it through faith. So all you're contributing is just acceptance. It's just receiving it through faith, through belief. But then you have to ask yourself the question, well, okay, if you have accepted this gift by faith, and it's God's free gift of grace that has saved you, then... Is that all there is to the Christian life? Well, St. James in his letter says, faith by itself without works is dead. And the book of Hebrews even says the demons, the ones in hell, even they have faith. They believe in God, but their belief in God makes them tremble, makes them fear. So wasn't it enough? It isn't enough just to have the thought God exists in your head, or even the thought God has died for me, and I believe that Jesus has died for me and has saved me. To have that thought and to submit or assent to that proposition is not really enough. It's just the beginning, in fact. It can bring about forgiveness. It can make you right with God. But this is just the beginning. What follows, really, is a whole life of progressive transformation. And this happens through acts of love through really making that faith real externally in your life. Or as Sri puts it, allowing the love of God that has entered you to radiate out of you and characterize all that you do. And so this is why St. James says that if faith doesn't manifest itself through some external sign that love is at work in you, then it's useless. Uh, it has to grow into maturity. And finally, another verse from St. Paul, it is for freedom that Christ set you free. So what, what is really the, the primary characteristic of the Christian life? Well, it should be freedom. It should be immersion in the reality of God, in a loving relationship with God. The reason Christ has set you free is not just so that you can enjoy goodies in heaven. It is so that you can be fully who you were meant to be, fully free. And the verse that follows that is instructive. For Christ, for freedom, Christ set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So faith should lead you to Christ, but it should also change your life. To go simply back into the old habits that you had before, into the old sins that made you uh, dull and insensitive, uh, this is an improper response to the gift that you've been given. And so to be truly free, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to change you, to allow the transformation 
uh, that has begun to continue. And so there should be some real change, some real transformation. And the, the, the final uh, character of this transformation is the bottom line really is the Holy Spirit empowers us to act as Christ acted empowers us to love as Christ loved. The Holy Spirit is, in a way, the perpetuation of the Incarnation through those who receive God's presence through the Holy Spirit. Then really what the Holy Spirit does is it makes little Christs in the world. Or it, it incorporates, perhaps more accurately, it incorporates new members into the one body of Christ so that God can continue to act in the world through Christ, but with the instruments of our frail and sinful humanity. Uh, and we can truly act on Christ's behalf as Christ acted, and love on Christ's behalf as Christ loved, uh, but not on our own. We need this gift of the Holy Spirit. So next lecture, we'll talk more about the specifics of how this transformative action works, how God acts through a person without kind of possessing or overriding that person's freedom. Uh, and so uh, that'll be for Friday. And um, just a reminder, uh, today, uh, Wednesday, at the end of the day is when your papers are due. So if you need an extension, just let me know. Otherwise, I look forward to receiving those papers by the end of the day on Wednesday. So I uh, hope you're all well and um, take care until next time.